And if you look at the UK again, I'll echo back to pension mis-selling as a unique and specific issue to their economy. The other issue is you got to consider how regula regulation has evolved in the various economies around the world. In the US, state regulations are unique and different. Think about New York State, companies that operate in New York State. Uh, very, very unique in institutions going on in the states, different from ours. UK regulation is different for two reasons. Number one, they have a long history of mis-selling. And I'll tell you that. If you study the, the UK, a lot of history there, and that has really changed the psyche of the consumer and the regulator. But the other point I'd make is that the FSA is both a prudential and a compliance regulator. That is like having OSFI and the Canadian Council of Insurance Regulators combined. It's a very, very different model than our own. So we have to think about Canadian regulation and put it in that context. Now, the question is, can regulation go global? And I will tell you it has already. Consider anti-money laundering regulation. Uh, in 1990, the international body, the Financial a Action Task Force, developed international anti-money laundering legislation, or at least policy, I'll call it. Countries were called to voluntarily step up and adopt these recommendations. And interestingly, that was 1990, it took 10 to 11 years for countries to adopt that regulation. Why do you think that happened? 9-11. Everybody thought it was interesting. They watched from afar and said, oh yeah, it's interesting, but you know, we'll get to that when we get to that. 9-11 occurs, terrorist thre threats occur, and suddenly what happens? In Canada, we developed the anti-terrorist financing legislation in 2001. Over time, the Financial Action Task Force has actually developed teeth. They now have ratings of economies around the world. A, an economy that's considered compliant is considered a low-risk financial sector. That's positive. A country that's deficient in their anti-terrorist activities is considered higher risk, and you're put on watch. A country that's considered non-cooperative there's a high risk warning related to putting capital into those sectors. So think about globalization of regulation. There's a perfect example of that. Today at home, what do you experience? Well, you deal with things like FinTrack and OSFI and, and uh, politically exposed foreign persons in terms of the tracking of individuals. You may not know that you're doing it, but the companies that you do business with are doing it. It's here and it's here to stay. So if you think about, well, what's going on globally, at least outside of, um, on the insurance side or on the financial sector side beyond that, globalization of prudential regulation is going on right now. Uh, three new bodies have evolved over the last three years. The first I'd speak to is the Financial Stability Board. You may never have heard of it, but it's a multi-sector body established to address vulnerabilities and develop and implement strong regulatory and supervisory policy. That's what its definition is. Examples would be the financial services executive compensation practices. Have you read about that in the paper? This has teeth. That is going to change the way banks compensate. That's going to change the way insurers compensate. That will change the way equity companies compensate. Is Canada participating? Absolutely. OSFI, the Department of Finance, and the Bank of Canada are all heavily involved. Second, the International Association of Insurance Supervisors has evolved. And their job is to provide globally accepted frameworks for the regulation and supervision of the insurance sector. An example would be the joint forum. Our joint forum here in Canada matches up with an international joint forum that's looking at all the same issues. Is Canada participating? Absolutely. The CCIR and the AMF are both participating actively. Finally, the joint forum, and this is an international joint forum, is trying to identify gaps and differences in oversight of banking, securities, and insurance sectors. So I know there's lots of discussions about a single regulator, and I'm not sure whether that will happen in our lifetime or not, but I do know that OSFI and the MF are both active in that and will be influencing those discussions. So although all of this is prudential regulation, distribution compliance is not off the table. If you read their papers, it says distribution is something to be considered in the future. So we have to consider what that might mean to us. A way to consider how, what it might mean is to look at a global model that is, is quite close to home, and this would be the UK Financial Services Authority. And I may be covering ground that was covered earlier, earlier today, but I think it's important to think about what these rules are all about. 
It's also important to remind you that the UK FSA is both a prudential and a market conduct regulator, so they come at it holistically in, in terms of the market. The FSA's 2009 consultation paper was focused on making changes in distribution regulation with the objective of improving the quality of investment advice for clients. Sounds a lot like uh, the, the principles-based regulations we have in place. Now I, I would remind you this is the quality of investment advice, not insurance advice. It brought forward three main platforms. The first is polarization. Polarization is about restricted versus independent advice, and in particular, the fact that advisors in 2012 will have to disclose their relationship to suppliers, and they will have to indicate whether they're aligned with a single or narrow group of advisors or they're truly independent, and it will be required at every contact with every client. A second is disclosure of investment advice, services, and costs. And most importantly, in 2012 in the UK, on investment products, advisors will not be paid any sales commission or trailers by a manufacturer. It will be the absolute separation of the transaction fee and the advice fee. There will no longer be commissions on investment products in the UK in 2012. Thirdly, and this echoes the sentiment I heard earlier today, professional standards and minimum education. Setting minimum requirements, and today they're talking about one year of college, but they're talking about two years at some point in the future for educational and professional development standards in the UK. So all of this is over the, the, all of this is over the pond. It's not here in Canada. But these rules are be, being put into practice, and you have to think about if these were put into practice today in Canada, what would you do? What would you have to do to change your financial practice? Our current Canadian insurance distribution regulation is largely principles-based rather than rules-based, and I believe that's a good thing. Our guidelines have been developed not through conflict, but through consultation with and through cooperation between all industry stakeholders. Think about when we developed advisor disclosure. It was an open discussion with the CCIR, the Canadian Council of Insurance Regulators. The CLHIA was at the table. Advocates was at the table. Insurers were at the table. Advisor groups like KALU were at the table. We had everyone at the table working in cooperation to say, what are we going to do to make this work? Now, it's great to come up with a policy. Is everybody at the table enforcing right now is a question I'd put forward. These guidelines actually address all of the same issues that the UK's FSA rules were developed for, and that's all about quality of advice and the client's best interest, and I believe that is what it has to be all about. If you consider advisor disclosure, it focuses on disclosing compensation models and relative independence from a manufacturer, including any conflicts of interest. That sounds a lot like the UK regulation to me.